Hello there, and welcome to Sound Off, a series where I review silent films. And yes, the name is a play on words. It is also a name that I failed to bring up in my first film review, A Trip to the Moon. My name is Gary, and today I'll be reviewing a film from 1929, which is at the tail end of the silent era. I have to be honest, I have some reservations about the film in focus. I'm not the biggest fan of surrealism. I take that back. I'm not a fan. At all. Now, that doesn't mean I hate it. Just because I don't understand something doesn't mean I don't respect it or appreciate it in some way. An Andalusian dog, or better known in French, Un Chien Andalou, is a Franco-Spanish surrealist film. It was directed by Luis Buñuel and Salvador Dali, who's famous in his own right for his melting clock painting. I like weird shit, probably more than I'm willing to admit but not when I can't make sense of it. That is this film in a nutshell. But don't take my word for it. It's definitely the sort of film you need to see for yourself. The film opens with a title card reading, Once Upon a Time. A man stands by his balcony door, smoking a cigarette and sharpening his razor. He goes out onto his balcony and gazes up at the moon. As long as he doesn't wait to it, I'm good. We get a close-up of a woman and... You know what? Just watch. After all these years, I still cringe at that. The next title card reads, Eight Years Later. A young man rides his bike through the city streets, wearing what looks like nun attire. A peculiar box hangs from his neck. A woman, the same woman from earlier, sits in her lavish apartment alone. She's reading a book until she hears the man on the bike approaching. So I have a question about that. How? How could she hear him approaching? She's on the second floor. He's on a bike. Bikes don't make noise. I mean, it's not old or rusted. He's not singing or whistling. So, how? When she goes to the window, she sees him fall down. By the time she gets to him, he's unconscious. Then she starts kissing him. They better know each other, otherwise that's sexual harassment. Back in her apartment, she opens the peculiar box and takes out a tie. She lays the man's belongings on the bed. The young man, now awake, stands by the door in new clothing. She watches as he stares at his hand, which has a hole. No blood, of course, just ants. If that were my hand, I would have already sliced it off while crying like a baby. As they're reading my mind, a severed hand lies on the street. It obviously attracts a small crowd. In the middle of that crowd is a young woman with short hair and a coat too large for her small frame. No one seems to mind that she's poking at it with a stick. The police picks up the hand and puts it in the peculiar box before giving it to her. The woman and man watch from the window above. I had a theory that the young man had amnesia. The woman who found him wanted to keep him to herself, and the woman with short hair was actually his wife and looking for him. She took the hand because she recognized it as her husband's. Now that would have made some sense. But, as we'll see, making sense is a crime in this film. So, the woman with short hair stands in the street, lost in thought. She should probably move. Or maybe the drivers could slow it down a notch. The man, meanwhile, watches on, seemingly enthralled by the danger she's in. Oh, what a surprise. She's hit by a car. But seriously, how did the driver not see her? It's broad daylight. Seeing the woman's death changes the man to become deranged. He starts molesting the poor woman, imagining her nude and everything. She fights back in a chase and shoes around the room. Cornered, she looks on in horror and, dare I say it, bewilderment, as the man drags two grand pianos with dead carcasses on top, behind him with rope. Oh, and two flummox priests. The woman exits the room and traps the man's hand in the door. We see that the hand is still infested with ants. So that means 
that the severed hand on the street from earlier wasn't his. Whatever. While in the room, the woman suddenly notices that the man is now on the bed, wearing his nun attire again. The subsequent titled card reads, Around 3 in the morning. A man in a hat rings the doorbell, which apparently sounds like a martini shaker. I really want to know what's going on. Like, really. It looks like as though the woman answered the door, but she just disappears. The man in the hat enters the room, berates the young man, and forces him to throw away his non-attire before he stands with his face to the wall, pouting. The title card now reads 16 years ago, yet it's the same scene. The man in the hat turns out to be the same person as the younger man, or at least played by the same actor. He gives the younger man two books to hold. They turn into guns, of course, and he shoots the man in the hat. He dies, but in a meadow. We briefly see the woman, but naked, from behind. As he dies, she fades away. That's okay though, because we see her again, fully clothed, and back in her apartment. The younger man is there too. He manages to wipe his mouth off his face, which I must say is a pretty impressive feat. In that moment, the woman feels compelled to put on her lipstick. Her armpit hair suddenly appears where the man's mouth should be. I have no words. She walks out defiantly, but not before sticking her tongue out on him. Twice. Now we're at the beach. The woman meets up with yet another young man who's wearing a sweater vest that I can't help but admire. The man oh so subtly shoves his watch in her face to remind her that she's late. They get over it and walk away into the distance holding each other. They come across the box and an attire on the rocky shore, but it means nothing to them. With the title card reading in spring, we see that the pair is dead and buried up to their waist in the sand. The end. Dare I say happily ever after? I've got so many questions. Like, what happened to the middle-aged man in the opening scene? We never see him again. What happened to the short-haired woman with the big coat? We never see her again either. Oh, that's right. She's dead. Whose severed hand was that? Does it even matter? What on earth is this? Are those the Ten Commandments? Are those pumpkins? Martini shakers for a doorbell? Books become weapons? The couple just dead? Are they implying something about marriage? I mean, what's the point of making a film that doesn't go anywhere? Why tell a story that has no cohesive narrative? That being said, the film does have some things going for it. The cinematography is great. It does what it's supposed to do, which is to keep you off balance. Even the special effects are pretty good. The idea for this film spawned from several dream sequences they had. They wanted to replicate not only the feel of a dream, but also the logic. At some point, you just had to throw up your hands and give in to the insanity. Unlike A Trip to the Moon, this film utilizes title cards, but with minimal effect. They didn't do anything other than piss me off. I'm also just realizing that this is the second film in a row with eye mutilation. So sorry about that. There's not a theme, I promise. Do I recommend an Andalusian dog? Sure, if you're looking for a creative way of punishing yourself. I know, it's art. It's avant-garde. I'm just too stupid to see its brilliance. Other than the eyeball sequence, I felt nothing but frustration, which is a shame because I really want to like this. The only way I can see myself ever watching this film again is if, I don't know, there was some drinking game. Actually, that's not a bad idea. If anyone out there wants to try that, let me know. But of course, drink responsibly. Now, for today's fun fact. You may have noticed that there is no Andalusian dog, or any dog for that matter, anywhere in the film. That's because the title refers to the Spanish expression, an Andalusian dog howls. Someone has died. 
Does it have anything to do with the veil? Of course it doesn't. Well, that's it from me. Thank you so much for watching. If the weather's good, where you are, take a walk. Because that's what I'm about to do. I need to. So, see you next time.